Martin from Steffi Ball Promotions. Uh, delighted to announce our next guest, Adam Cattrall. Adam, thank you very much for giving us some of your time. Mate, thank you very much uh, for asking us on. It's normally me asking questions. It's nice to be asked questions and just have general conversations about fight sports. I'm looking forward to it. No, no, that's fantastic. Um, I will start off with uh, some terrible news um, on the weekend. Uh, marvellous Marvin Hagler. Um, mm. A lot of a lot of boxing fans out there. It's hit them quite hard because um, one of the best boxers of our of, of, of their prime of our prime. Um, what's your thoughts? Like, uh, what did you think of him as a fighter? Well, sensational fighter, mate. I mean, when you're talking about the greatest middleweights of all time, marvelous Marvin Hagler's name is in there, isn't he? You know what I mean? With uh, with some other legends from yesteryear. The the, tr the striking thing is, of course, he's 66, and when you are aware of the way that the man went about fighting for him to go at this particular age, especially if you've ever seen him speak recently, he he came across that he had all his faculties. He, he, he was healthy. He was living a, a wonderful life. And when you go back to that particular era of fighting where there's fighters in the, in the present world that are maybe struggling right now because of the damage that they took back then, Marvis Marvin Hagler wasn't one of those guys. So it's a, it came as incredibly shocking news on, on Saturday night when that came through. I was actually live on the radio when the news came through. And it's one of those moments where you, you have to take a little bit of a step back. It takes your breath away a little bit because out of all the names that you expect to see or start to read an obituary for, Marvin Hagler was most certainly not one of those people that I would have had on the list. So when it came through, it was incredibly sad. But then you start to reminisce about some of the fantastic moments that this man has provided for all boxing fans over the years. Of course, part of the Four Kings dynasty of the 80s. Um, and for many, the king of all the kings, you know? Yeah, okay, he lost that split decision against uh, Sugar Rain in his last fight. Uh, but I think he still comes out of that with a lot of kudos and a lot of winners uh, that w that's maintaining that winning mentality. I think for a particular generation of fans and fighters, he would have inspired them to lace up the gloves or even just to continue become, becoming a boxing fan. And it, the word legend gets thrown around so much, doesn't it? In all aspects of sports, you know, people, oh, he's a legend, him, or he's, he's the goat or, or, or whatever it may be. But in, in all seriousness, when you analyse what Marvin Hagler did career-wise, what he stood for, the way he went about his business, the way that, just the, just the way he was as a guy, you know, I mean, I, was, I wasn't in the lucky position to ever interview him or spend any time with him, but I, there's a lot of my contemporaries and people that I work with that most certainly did, and I spoke to them all on the radio on Saturday night, and they were just gushing with praise and love for, for, for what he did. And all I can do is, as a fan of this sport is, is thank him for, for sharing his talent with us and, and for having the attitude that he had. And I hope that maybe some of the younger fighters and the modern-day fighters now look listening to the things that people are saying about Marvin Hagler and maybe they take a little bit of that and try and instill it into their own careers because he did fight the best of the best at the back end of his career and he gave us the fights that all the fans wanted and he did it and he did it in a bloody entertaining way, <laughs> mate. Jesus Christ. If, if, if you watched that for the fight with Hearns in round one, you couldn't imagine a boxing fight. Like the commentators now, the likes of, you got the Carl Frotch, you got the Matt Macklin's, they get excited when there's like a, 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 a good dust up in like round three or round four when it's kind of when the fight's kind of just getting warm. He, my, against Hearns in that first round, the, it was just absolutely mental. It, it, literally, when, when you watch it back and you just and it wasn't that the fact that he was he, he he just got in there, he took a shot, and my god, did he give a shot back? And it was constant, it was constant, constant. There was no what they must what they used. What their training schedules must have been like when they were uh, when they were in training must have been scary. Yeah, they, I, I think it's quite apt as well that at the weekend we got 
Estrada and Chocolatito giving us the fight that they gave us because it was very Hearns Hagler esque at times, wasn't it? I know that Hearns and Hagler on, only lasted for three rounds, but geez, man, it was very similar where they just leathered the living daylights out of each other. So, yeah, man, it was that. I mean, that round one in that fight is probably the greatest round of boxing that has ever been, and I don't think it's ever going to get tops. It was unbelievable. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you, I think it'll be fair to say if you was to look on YouTube uh, at the end of this week, that will be up there. As one of the spots, one hundred percent has to be. Yeah, has yeah, to be. I agree. I um, agree. Going on to that, but yeah, so um, R.I.P. Uh, to marvelous Marvin. I uh, hope his family are, are well as well. And like you said, going on to the Chocolato fight, Estrada. Um, I th- read this morning that one of the judges has been suspended. Yeah, I saw that. The WBA have come out, and uh, Mr. Sucre, who came up with the one hundred and seventeen, one hundred and eleven card, which is baffling, really. I mean, I've, I've I've looked at the card and how he's tried to break that down, and he's given the last five rounds to Estrada, which I don't know how you can conclude that. You know, don't get me wrong, the rounds are tight and they they are close, they they, they are. But round twelve, I found the easiest round of them all to score. I thought Chocolatito did the business in, in that particular round, and there's no way that there's a streak of five straight rounds to any one fighter in. Uh, in that fight, I'm glad that the listen. I slag the WBA off, BA off, like left, right, and centre mate with some of the decisions that they make. Uh, we may even come on to that in this conversation. Who knows? But um, for them to take action against one of the judges or to investigate him, I think is a good step. You know, we've had a few recently, haven't we? Where we've had some cards where all fans have gone, "What the blooming heck was that person watching?" And it's kind of been brushed under the carpet and 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 left. And listen, we're not innocent here in in Britain. British Boxing Board of Control have got some questions to answer when it comes to various judging and judging decisions. And, and I'm glad that, that, that even though I don't think anybody can argue that um, anybody can argue with Estrada winning. I mean, I personally scored it for Chocolatito, but I've spoken to other friends of mine that have scored it to Estrada. So I go, all right, fair enough. It was a bloody close fight. It was tight, yeah? So a split decision was sound with it. But when you do get a card like that, 117, 111. I'm glad that even though people aren't arguing with the result per se, that it is flagged up, it is investigated, and I just thought something's done about it, or maybe a better education is done either for the judge or a more transparency for the fans, because I think the fans need to know, wh- how have you got to that, mate? How, how have you got to that point to judge it in, in, in that way? I mean, even on, even on that same night, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the McCaskill-Breakers fight um, on the undercard, um, where one judge did not score any rounds whatsoever to to Cecilia Breakhouse in that fight. And I know she had a point deducted, so they came back with 189 as a scorecard. I'm thinking, listen, I've no argument with McCaskill winning. McCaskill won the fight. But to say that Breakhouse didn't win any rounds? Come on, man, what are we watching? Yeah, it's not fair on the fighters because they're putting their, no. they're putting their heart and soul into it. And three people ringside... A kind of like you said, if 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 they've got a scorecard and they've got say um, they've got a strider winning, that's understandable. And uh, they've got uh, McCaskill winning, that's understandable. Be fair, be fair, and yeah, because it, it it's demoralising for the fighter as well. Because if you've got a fighter that's pushing themselves, pushing themselves to the limits, and all of a sudden they come off and they're like, I didn't win a round. What what could I have done different? Or yeah, yeah, it, it's. It, I, it's happened with Canelo Alvarez versus Golovkin a couple of years ago, if you remember as well, when it was, I think that was a 117, 111. And you kind of just look and you think, I understand boxing is very much opinionated. It, it clearly is. If, if there's not a knock knockdown, it's the judges decide what it is. But be fair, be fair on the fighters. Yeah, yeah. And like transparency, I think is key. You know, I think people need to be held at the moment. You can do stuff. You can referee a fight in boxing, you can judge a fight in boxing, and then you move on to the next thing. You need to be held accountable for some of the things because, like you've just said, you're holding people's careers in your hands, aren't you? You know. Yeah. So if yeah. you're if you're going to judge it in a certain way and it goes against the grain of what the majority of people are saying, as we are talking about in this particular case, then come out, be transparent about it, try and justify it to your own best, best means, because I would like to think that there's no corruption or anything wrong in the sport. I know that that's daft, but you know what I mean? I'd like to think that. But if someone can come out and say, this is why I've scored it this way, then it helps fans understand, first and foremost. But then second of all, it might help that person then go, 
actually, yeah, maybe I did get that one wrong and I'll need to be better next time. And that's all we want. We just want fair, honest judging, don't we? Yeah, no, 100%. And that's all the fighters want as well, as well as well as the uh, fans. Because we, we all know, you take a loss, a, a loss happens. It's not the end of your career. But Correct. going through a fighter not winning a round is kind of, and as well, coming to the end of a career as well, like off the back of two defeats now, it's kind of, well, you ain't give me no, you ain't give me no justice there whatsoever. Um, but as I said before, um, boxing and UFC. I know UFC is a massive uh, sport for you. Um, mm -hmm. How unlucky was Leon Edwards the weekend? That is the most Leon Edwards end into a fight that, that you know, a man that's been out of the octagon for six hundred and three days. Right, he comes back. And his fight ends in a no contest. And it ends in a way where for six minutes that it lasted, he looked, man, he's, he's switching beautifully. He's flowing beautifully. His shot selection at one point in the first round, you think he's going to get him out of here with that head kick. And then the most unfortunate of circumstances where he pokes his opponent in the eye. And listen, it's a bad one. There's no getting away from it. It's a bad one. Bilal Mohammed has most certainly suffered some serious pain there and some serious damage. So uh, there's, no, there's nothing from me on him for not continuing that fight. The right decision was made. And we have this, we have more, I suppose, more questions than answers coming off the back of it. What happens next now? Do, do we, can we get a quick turnaround? Do we go back in with Bilal? Do we go, do we try and fight? Colby Covington or a Stephen Thompson or something, you know? It's just, I feel for Leon, man. He's, he's incredibly mentally tough, that lad. Anybody that's ever spent any time with him, they'll know about his upbringing. He's gone through the mire, but to go through what he's gone through over the last two years in, in the UFC, where he's watching this, develop, this division develop, whilst he's sat there going, what the bloody hell's going on? All these title shots and these shots are mine. Well, well why am I not getting them? Exactly. Because of this crazy pandemic. You know, then he gets back in the octagon and bear in mind, this is a replacement opponent that he's fighting at the weekend. The other fella that he was supposed to be fighting is sadly suffering with uh, lingering effects of COVID. It's mad. It's all, it's just been a horrific year for him. I just hope that he can stay fit and healthy and the UFC turn him around quick. I think I was looking the other day where the next available main event slot is May the 8th. And when I say that, main event, for those that don't follow it, that would mean a five-round fight rather than a three-round fight. This was a five-round fight. I don't want him to go back in and fight a three-round fight because he'd, he'd walk that. He needs something proper. He needs a five-round fight, and the next available slot's May the 8th. So if I was the UFC, I'd go, right, Leon, you're 100% fighting it. If Bilal's fit, sweet, let's turn it around. Let's get him straight back in there. If he's not fit, if he's, his eye's not right, let's go and find a top five contender to fight, uh, fight you on that particular night. Who would you put up against him? Colby Covington, mate. That'd I can't. I, listen, he's been offered it. Colby's been offered it and he's turned it down. Now, he's obviously got an opinion of himself where he believes that he should be fighting for titles and what have you, but it's quite evident that the UFC, with Kamara Usman, the champion, are going to go down the Jorge Masvidal route. All right? That's where they want to go, maybe because it sells more. I don't know. Fine. And, and that's they, cool. And, and, and them two having uh, another ultimate fighter champ, uh, another ultimate. Well, that's the rumor. Yeah, that, that is the rumor. They, they are bringing him back the ultimate fighter. We. we Thought it was going to be Masvidal and Colby. And then off the back of Usman's last fight against Gilbert Burns, he called out Masvidal, which was a bit of a weird turn. But if you think about it, he's cleaned out his division. Now it's about the cheddar. It's about the money, isn't it? Where's yeah. the big money? The big money is obviously uh, Jorge Masvidal. There's no doubt about that. So for the UFC, from a business point of view, it makes perfect sense. Let's do him as the ultimate fighter. They can go back and forth with each other. We'll make some good TV. And then we'll obviously have the fight uh, late summer. So with that in mind, Colby Covington's left without a dance partner. Who does he go and dance with? Well, he's been offered the Leon fight and he said no to it. So, and fair enough, if he wants to turn that down on a short notice situation, I fully respect that. I respect any fighter at that level. Well, he's a good fighter. I need a full camp to get ready for him. That's cool, man. You know, if they are, if they made that offer to him this week, he now has a full camp. He's got eight weeks to go and get ready for, for this. If he turns it down now, the UFC have got some serious questions to, to go through the, you know, they've removed Leon Edwards from the rankings for turning down fights. So, come on, man. You've got it first fair. If Colby Covington turns it down, you've got to remove him from the rankings. He shouldn't be in the welterweight rankings if he's turning down a fight with the number three ranked fighter. That's mad. Yeah. Well, he's got the... Uh, I, was re I was reading something on the internet. Um, I, I might be wrong. Uh, hopefully, I'm not. And Leon Edwards got the third highest uh, win streak in UFC yeah. history. Uh, in the welterweight division, yeah, of all time. So, you've got... You've got Kamaru, the champion at the moment. 
Joyce St. Pierre's uh, the next. I think he had 11 in the welterweight division. He got an extra one in the middleweight division. So he's on 12. And Leon's on eight. And obviously at the weekend, it was a no contest. So yeah, uh, it's the third longest in the welterweight division. Yeah. Well, surely if you as Colby, <laughs> if, I, if I get through him, then. But Colby, th- but Colby, th- listen, we're not daft. It's a bloody dangerous fight. Leon yeah. Edwards is probably the most rounded mixed martial artist that the UK has ever produced. And we've, we've produced some good ones, Bisping, world champion or whatever. But when it comes to rounded mixed martial artists, Leon Edwards is the man. Now, if you look at that, you think, right, is his profile big? No, not really. It's not. It's not massive with the guys in the United States. So it's high risk. Low reward? I don't know how Colby would look at it because if they marketed it in a way where the winner of this fight fights the winner of Usman Masvidal, then surely Colby would take that. You would think if he's got ambitions of getting himself back in for UFC gold. I think it's how it's sold to him. It needs to be sold as a world title eliminator. And if it is, he hasn't got any other options. You've got to go and fight Leon Edwards. I know it's a tough fight. I know it's bloody hard, but you, but it's supposed to be hard to become a world champion, isn't it? You're not supposed to be dishing around like sweets. So, and talk to the it. well, it's not as if you can pick and choose your fighter. So, do, do Mate, it's, it's becoming more. It's becoming more regular that where fighters seem to be picking what they're doing. Whereas the U, I became a fan of it because the UFC just gave the fans what they wanted. Not necessarily the best against the best all the time. They just gave the fans what they wanted. The fans want to see this. They want to see this. We're doing it. And whether you like it or not, it's happening. You know what I mean? Whereas now it seems to be more that the fighters are having a bit of a say of certain things happening. It's like, for example, let's say in football, you get to Champions League final, but you end up playing against Bayern Munich, but then you think, man, I don't fancy Bayern Munich. Um, I'll let somebody else, I'll let somebody else set the Bayern Munich fight. They can crack on with that. And I'll go and, I'll go and have a game against Ajax. What? <laughs> They've got Lewandowski. Yeah, I'm not yeah. doing that, mate. What are you doing? I'm not getting involved with that. <laughs> no, I t- 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 totally agree. Um, and as we said, going back to Marvin earlier, uh, Marvin Aglet, look, you get you in there with absolutely anyone. He'd have a fight on a Saturday and then the following Saturday and then the following Saturday after that. And that's that's what the previous fighters used to be. It's a bit like Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua. That that saga is starting to carry on now. It's starting yeah. to. It's there's, there's a few rumors coming out. Tyson Fury said last week, uh, Deontay Wilder Wilder's back in the in the hunt. I nah, don't bad. think that's true. I, I think that that's mind games. But I think Anthony Joshua is being very very clever with his mind games. He's not biting at all. No, at all. No, like I, I watched that interview. Um, and he was in the MTK bubble, wasn't it, on uh, on Friday night, I think, in Bolton or something. And uh, I remember watching that. And I just, I was giggling along all the way through it because anybody that's ever spent any time with Tyson Fury as a media member knows full well, he loves winding you up. He loves it. I've been in a room with Tyson Fury where there's five media members, BBC, us at Talk Sport, you've got the, the written press, they're all there. And for example, the guys from BBC, Mike Costello might do an interview and I'll be watching it going, oh, that's a nice little question. I might use that as part of my narrative. Two minutes later, he sits down with me. I ask him the same thing. He gives a different answer, right? <laughs> then, he'll go and, then he'll go and have a little bit of a chat with the guys at the uh, at Press Raw. They'll ask him the same question and he'll give another totally different answer. <laughs> Tyson Fury enjoys the wind up. It keeps him entertained. It keeps him amused. I take no conclusions from whatever he said in that interview that he's drinking 14 pints a day, stock training, or whatever it is that he said, right? That he's not in the mood for Anthony Joshua. He's well and truly in the mood for Anthony Joshua. He's just frustrated that there's no dates as of yet. Joshua, you bang on. Joshua is the most consistent dude when you interview him. He, you ask him a question today, there's the answer. You ask him a quick, same question next week, it's the same answer, man. He's consistent with what he's saying. If he was answering questions like Tyson Fury, you'd think that there was something up, but that, because it's not in his character or his makeup. This fight, both guys want it. All the teams want it. I think, I personally think the thing that is troubling it at the moment is that we're in a pandemic. Nobody really knows what the bloody hell's going on. This fight, everybody watching this or listening to this will conclude a fight of this magnitude, the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. Are you telling me you want this behind closed doors? I don't. It doesn't deserve to be. It's a historic moment. Now, many might say, well, just get it on. Yeah. Just get it on. But let's give it what it deserves, man. If it means waiting an extra one, two, three months, sound, fine, no problem whatsoever. Let's give it what it deserves. 
it will happen. I'm confident it will happen. I can just understand the frustration from everybody. Fans, fighters. You could, you could see it in Fury's face last week when he was being interviewed. He's frustrated, man. He just wants the bloody date so he can get on with it, you know? In the meantime, he's just going to keep winding everybody up, saying that he's on the lash. Yeah. Well, if he's on the lash, it looks really good for being on the lash. Yeah, man. I, I wish I looked like that. <laughs> it's like a quarter of the... A, three quarter, a quarter of the man that he was when he first... When he fought Walder, he's... He, he's He's ridic- ridiculously in shape. So, like you said, I I, I took it with a pinch of salt. But the media love it, then they like as soon as like I think the Su- Sun Sport, I think Sun Sport was straight on it. Then Joshua Fury, uh, and uh, did you see what Bob Aaron said the weekend to uh, yeah. to fans? Was it? Yeah, I think it was to one of them. When he took, when he took, I don't know if he could swear on this, but he told them to go and f themselves or something, didn't he? <laughs> or something like that. But that's Bob. Listen, Bob's it. What is he? Nearly ninety years of age. He couldn't care less, man. He's, he's, he's no filter as the fella. Bang, straight out there. Um, that's maybe going too far, Bob. Maybe, maybe we need to treat fans with a little bit more respect because they're the people putting their hand in the pocket in order to create these multi-millions uh, of dollars that are around this fight. But again, there's frustration in there. It takes a... If the pandemic wasn't here, I'm confident that we'd all be sat here going, we've only got two months left two months left and we're doing this at wherever we're doing it at. You know what I mean? It would have been booked. But right now, they're sat there going, it needs a good 80,000 people. It has, so, to, it has, it has so to. It has so to. So where do we do it, you know? Because even though there's a two-fight deal signed, which is which is what we all expect, is there a two-fight deal signed if, say, Fury absolutely outboxes Joshua from round one to 12, beats him up, knocks him out, and then Joshua will turn around and say, you know what? And imagine if that happens in front of a quarter of a stadium. Yeah, man. It can't. It's it, it, it can't. But if you go back to it's, Bob Aaron, it's, it's, it's historic. Sorry, sorry. It, I just don't. It's for uh, for people that are into boxing that have been here for a long period of time following this sport. You'll know what this means. We haven't had an undisputed heavyweight champion since 1999, man. You know, that's a long time to be waiting to unify the, the whole bloody division. Now, th- yeah, I get it. The Klitsch girls had the belts and they wouldn't fight each other and all that type of stuff. But f- f- for that moment to come around, and again, I'm being biased because it's a British thing, for that moment to come around and it, for it to be two Brits involved in it, come on, let's give it the pomp and ceremony. Because in my lifetime covering this sport, is it going to happen again? I don't know. Because you know full well that as soon as it happens and as soon as they're all together... You know that them alphabet sanctioning bodies are going to come along and go, right, lads, you've got to fight this mandatory. You've got to fight this mandatory. You've got to split this up. So they're all going to go back into the wind at some point. Well, you've already That's got UC. Seven. You've already there got UC go. asking the question straight away. There you go. That's the thing. The, 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 the question is when, uh, going back a couple of weeks ago, when Warrington lost to Lara, Tyson Fury's first thing was another one bites the dust to inactivity. Now, we're going to be doing the same with Fury. He's going to be really, really, really inactive. When, when, if he fights Joshua, say, September, he's been out of the ring nearly two... I know he was out of the ring before, but mm. he has been out of the ring for another two years. Mate, we're talking about a dude that was £300, right? <laughs> yeah. Came, came back, had a little bit of a dance. I mean, six months, he's fighting for the uh, World Championship in, in Los Angeles. I know he had two fights in, in the build-up, but they weren't... Anybody that saw the Safiri fight or whatever, they weren't fights, man. He turned up for a bit of a dance with a crowd, didn't he? They weren't proper fights. He's he has a natural ability to fight, and that's it. Just ring the bell and let him go at it. He'll know he, he knows what to do. He'll just be on instinct. He knows what to do. Um, so I'm the certain fighters, of course, I'm worried about inactivity. But then there's others that you just go, I'm not bothered because they're just natural fighting people. It's like the Billy Joe Saunders thing with Canelo. People are going, oh, is it, oh, he could have done a couple of these before. Maybe. Come on, man. He's been doing this all his life. He knows exactly what... All he, all Billy's got to do is get in shape. Get in shape, and then... Oh, I'm not saying he's going to beat Canelo, because Canelo's unreal. But at least he'll be able to give his best in that particular contest. The Billy Joe that fought Lemieux has a chance of beating Canelo, in my yeah. opinion. But... Yet again, you're going to have the judges as well, and yeah. If the judges scored it 117, 111 to Canelo against Golovkin, and Golovkin mm-hmm. caught Canelo with some crack, Billy Joe don't possess the power, does he? So, but he's got to do something. He has to well, do the, to get the judges. The, the beautiful thing that he's got in his favour 
is he is a slick southpaw that creates angles for fun. Now, if you look down Canelo's career, of course, there's only that one defeat to, to Floyd. But if you look at the Arisande Lara fight, there's in, there's moments in there that you think, well, there's a bit of there's a bit of trouble in here. And many people actually come away from it going, Lara beat him. Yeah. He didn't obviously get the decision that particular night. But that slickness, the southpaw stance, and the way that he created angles gave um, Canelo a lot of questions to answer that many think that he didn't fully answer that particular night. So Billy's got all the skills in the world, mate, to cause trouble. The problem is, over that period of time, is that Canelo's developed. He's getting better. You're looking at this guy and you're going, he can go forwards, he can go backwards. He can, <laughs> mate, it's ridiculous what this fella can do. He's absolutely... He is the perfect fighter. There's no doubt. I know that he's got the Clem Butrell shadow hanging over him or whatever. But there's no doubt for me he's the best. And I know we've got a new era. We've got the Tiafimo Lopez is coming through, the Terence Crawfords and all that. He's the best fighter on the planet, Canelo. There's no doubt in my mind. If Billy goes over there and beats him, it's the best British victory overseas of all time. And I'm bringing in Lloyd Hunnigan, Donald Curry, and all those types of fights. It is the best one just because of the stature Canelo's at. And where Billy's kind of been at over the last three years, because he hasn't shown any... Uh, us all sitting here going, Billy's going to go beat uh, Canelo. He hasn't shown us that over the last three years, man. But do I believe he's got it in him to be able to go and do it? And if all the stars align on a particular night? Yeah, he does. I just hope, I, I just hope he gives it us on that particular night. Yeah, no, did, did you think, on, honest honest opinion, did you think Billy Joe would be Andy Lee? That night. Oh, that's a good shout, man. That's a good shout. Because uh, I'll, I'll probably say... Maybe it's... not. Maybe not, no. Because of where Andy Lee was and the performances that Andy... Andy Lee had done up until that point. No, maybe, maybe, maybe that's a good one. Actually, yeah, I've never even thought about it. Maybe, maybe you're right. I would have probably had Andy Lee going into that fight, but Billy would regret. And that, that, and that's what Billy does. Then he brings things to the table, and it's, it's, it's such a good fight. It's such a, such a good fight, and I can't wait for that fight. And a lot of people think of Billy Joe. Are you still there? A lot of people think of um, Billy Joe against uh, Martin Murray, but that's Billy Joe just literally just wanting to get in the ring and just 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 get involved in boxing. That that's that that that's all it was. And but now I'm... fighters fight, fighters like Billy and Tyson, they need real je- they need to feel that the other dude can do them. Yes, yes. They need to feel jeopardy in a fight. They need to like the Lemieux thing. Lemieux has whether. He's not as good as a boxer as Billy, but he has power, man. Only needs a little clip on them whiskers and you're going, you know? So that is why you get a performance like that from, from Billy on that particular night, because he's on edge. He, there's a fear factor there, you know? There, there's a little bit of, Ooh, right, I've got to be razor sharp here because if I switch off for a second, I'm going to kip. Tyson's exactly the same. Now, you watch the Safiri fights and the blah, 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 and you're thinking, oh, my God, this is awful. Fast forward six months to Los Angeles Staples Center, the most dangerous puncher in the heavyweight division, Deontay Wilder. Yeah, all right, he gets clipped a couple of times. Maybe that was because of ring rust, but he's still there. For 12 rounds, you're like going, he's won the fight. He got a bad decision, you know what I mean? That jeopardy, that moment of oh, fear factor, fighters like Billy Joe Saunders and Tyson Fury most certainly need it. When they fight someone who they believe is beneath them, they actually lower their standards to match the person they're fighting. Yeah. It's weird how it, how it happens. Normal, the no, normal guys go in there and just blow them away. But you but can't the motivation win, can you? isn't there. For they, can't they can't win. They no, can't win. Look at the other day against uh, Yildrim. It, it, it stopped him in three rounds and everyone's going, oh, yeah, but it was easy for Canelo. And you think, but if Canelo would let him go seven, eight rounds, they'd then be yeah. like, oh, Canelo was poor. Canelo couldn't, he, yeah. he, he, he didn't look any good. <laughs> You literally, they just they, they, they just they just cannot win. Um, as I said from the um, from the original intro, um, Steffi Ball promotions. Um, Steffi Ball actually Ring Magazine trainer of uh, female trainer of the year last year. What do you think of that for an accolade? Unreal, man. I mean, I I hold um, Ring Magazine quite high, mainly because of um, the alphabet belts just being alone to themselves at times, you know what I mean? You can never follow what they're going to bloody do next, making belts up for fun, da 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 So obviously Ring Magazine, with it be the magazine, and the, the way that they've incorporated that Ring Magazine belt, I kind of look at the Ring Magazine belt as the, the staple, you know what I mean? you got one of them, 
They're like hen's teeth. Only the number one and number two in a particular division can fight for one of those. And on the odd occasion, the number one division. So at the end of the year, the Ring Magazine awards for best fighter of the year, best trainer of the year, best fight of the year. I, I kind of really only go there yeah. for, 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 for what I'm looking for because they hold boxing to a higher account than the other sanctioning bodies. The other sanctioning, you, I mean, yeah, we just had a fight made where an unranked uh, female fighter fighting the number nine in a division for a bantamweight world title. And you're thinking, how on earth has the WBA, for example, sanctioned that? But Ring Magazine, you can't get one of them belts unless you're at the top of the tree. So if they're, whoever they're awarding their awards to at the end of the year, you kind of have to go, well, that's, that's, that's it. That, they're the commandment. That's, that's Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's in stone. Done. <laughs> but no, no I totally agree. And to be fair, what Steffi's done with Terry is, uh, is unreal. Like, I've sp I spoke to Steffi and I was like, what was the actual message like with Terry? And it, because it, you've, you've heard about it, and when he says, like, um, when she worked in a chip shop. And it, it, it is an actual fairy tale. It is an actual, probably. Oh, it's it's Rocky Balboa, mate. It's female Rocky Balboa. It's, it's yeah. the Cinderella yeah. story. That's exactly what it is, you know, for, to go from where. Terry has gone from, and I've been lucky enough to have a couple of conversations with Terry about life and just general where she's at as a person. The most normal human being that you're ever likely to come across, but as this ridiculous talent that uh, has taken her to the top of the top of the tree. And long may it continue. People like that, I think fans really buy into, you know, when they see a little bit of themselves and, and a real human being in their sports stars that they admire, that's what makes superstars at the end of the day. We saw it with Ricky Atten, didn't we? You know, that's why we that's why we all we all cleared off to Vegas for a for a bit of a knees up because Ricky was probably on the last wheels after the fight, you know, all those types of things. We Before see it, the fight. We see it with Josh Warrington. And, yeah, exactly. We see it with Josh Warrington and whatever. And I'm not saying that Terry's on the lash with the fans, but what I'm saying is is that because of the humble beginnings, the humble background, and the way that she she has remained that now as champion of the world. That holds a lot of water with a lot of fans, you know? So, yeah. So, fair play, man. I mean, like you say, it is a Rocky Balboa, Cinderella story. We we love them. We love them Hollywood stories in boxing, don't we? And the thing is, it's only just started. She's yeah. still young. She's still young. Like, she's apparently, hopefully, her fight's going to get announced uh, against that Choi. I think it's Choi. Uh, so, mm. and then I think, I think once the pandemic go not goes away, but like once, once the pandemic, once we come out of the pandemic, I think then she's going to be fighting in the States as well, which which is just going to be absolutely mesmerising for her. But Listen, I, I, I would love... Sorry, I, I, I know that maybe it's not the, the narrative, but the fight that, that she put on with Natasha Jonas was just absolutely outrageous. For, from a fan's point of view, it was brilliant. I'd love to see it again. Come on, man. Dish me, de deal me in. Deal me in. I want to go again. It was that good. Well, listen to this. I was listening to Eddie Earn on Saturday night. And apparently, Natasha Jonas versus Katie Taylor is close. Well, th there's a repeat of what we saw at the London 2012 Olympics. Obviously, Katie got, uh, got the job done that particular night. If Listen, that's a lovely reward, isn't it? I know that, obviously, Natasha's gone in there with Teddy. Teddy came out victorious on that particular night. I Like I said, I'd love to see the fight again because it was just so blooming good for Natasha to receive some type of reward, even coming out of there uh, without her hand raised to get someone like a Katie Taylor. Jeez, man, that's big. Absolutely massive, you know? So, yeah, I'm in. Female, this is the thing. Women's boxing's on it right now. Last year, if you look back at some of the fights that were dished up, a lot of the things that we were talking about at the end of year review were those fight camp nights where, where Terry and Natasha were going at it and, and, and others as well that were dishing up some absolute barnstormers. Probably one of the best women's fights I've seen. Um, as well as Terry versus uh, Jonas, was, is it Serrano versus Tyler on the undercard? Yeah. Of, who was fighting? Who was the main event now in America? Uh, when Joshua lost to Ruiz? Pierce Soon it was. It was Pierce, Taylor Pierce Soon, the first Pierce one. Soon. That fight, oh my, she's an animal, she's that yeah, yeah. Soon. Mate, it was, I mean, she was lucky that night. I thought that she beat Katie at Madison Square Garden, I'll be honest. Um, and the second fight, when they did the second one at uh, in the fight camp in Eddie's back garden, again another banger. Katie won that the second one. There's no there's no question about that. She showed her class that night. But the first one at Madison Square Garden on a weird 
night. Callum Smith won that night, then he against the Aston and Dam, and then you've obviously got AJ getting knocked out against Andy Ruiz. But the fight between Katie Taylor and Delphine Pierce soon, the first one was just like, what the bloody hell is this? This, I mean, think about it as well. You talk about Cinderella stories. Um, Pierce soon um, as a as, as a normal job. She's she, you know, she, 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 yeah, not a full time. She was at the time wasn't a full time athlete. Just coming in there, taking on the uh, Olympic champ. Jeez, man, this is what this game's all about. Crazy stuff. And she just walked forward, literally just walked forward. It was as if Katie Taylor was as if to say, you need to stop this. Like, I, I, need, I need to be able to box. I need to be able to show my skill. You're just walking straight through me. Can you stop it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we, well, we, kind of saw, we kind of saw the same style at the weekend. We uh, McCaskill against Breakhouse. Breakhouse, an elite level boxer, just couldn't get boxing. Just couldn't do it. Yeah. Because McCaskill was just going, not letting you, mate. Not letting you. I'm going to, sit, I'm going to get all of you. I'm going to swarm all of you. And I'm going to smother all your work and I'm going to land some heavy bombs myself. So it's that age old thing. Styles make fights, isn't it? Exactly. You know I mean? You've got to figure exactly. out every single style to be the best. That's what it is. Oh, no, definitely. Um, right. Honest opinion. YouTube fighters. Right. What do Just you in think? general? Um, right. In general, I've absolutely no problem whatsoever with anybody making any coin, doing whatever they want to do. Um, it comes down to me that the way that it's marketed, that's the first thing that I, I want to say. So if a, if a YouTube guy wants to fight a basketball guy, as we've said, so man, that's cool. Crack on, no bother whatsoever. But let's not market this as elite level boxing because that's not what it is. This is white collar. That's what it is, all right? Yeah. Um, I think it's... I think it's... Th that level is fine. When you're starting to talk about YouTube boxers, lads off YouTube with no real amateur pedigree or real understanding of the game for any length of time, to then fight actual fighters, I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing um, Jake Paul, Tommy Fury having a bit of a go with each other and having a bit of a chat and what have you. Oh, that, that brings me to it. Did you, uh, did you hear what Tyson Fury said about that as well? Go on. Well, he said, uh, he was like, so uh, Jake Paul obviously calling out Tommy Fury and Tyson Fury was like, Jay Paul's a good fighter. And he's like, and the, 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 the interview was like, yeah, he was like, yeah, he's, he goes, Tommy Fury's not a, prof he was like, he's not always been a professional fighter. He's an, he's an athlete. Jay Paul's an athlete. He'd be a cracking fighter. I think they should get it on. And you think, Listen, he's it, no, no, no. He's looking after his brother for coin there because there's a lot of money in the, 100%. Fight of that. 100%. I think when you merge the worlds, when, when YouTube comes in and it wants to fight, boxers or or even MMA artists. I mean, we saw him calling out Conor McGregor recently, don't we? That's when it gets dangerous. There's, there's a bit of neg... We've got to be careful there because if someone doesn't know how to defend themselves properly and, and look after themselves and what have you, fighting a proper fighter, you and you're going to end up getting chinned. We saw a period... Uh, we saw Rio Ferdinand, didn't we, a couple of years ago when he was <laughs> saying, I'm going to come and be a boxer. But then the British Boxing Board of Control, fair play to him, they went to go and see him and all that type of stuff. And they went... You're not getting a professional license off us, son. It's that, that's not how it works. You've got to pass the proper tests in order to, to get to certain levels. It, when the television companies market this stuff as elite level boxing, and then the casual audience who are obviously coming to that see it, and then they believe that to be elite level boxing, that's where I get a little bit concerned. When you see in YouTubers, top of the bill, and world champions undercut, like, Billy Joe Summers has been on the undercard of a YouTuber. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I understand. I understand it's a business move in order to try and grow Billy Joe's social media followings or whatever it may be to, to a new audience. I understand that. But what message is that sending to, to people coming to watch it about the sport? I think it dilutes what the real sport is all about. I think, I think a lot of young fighters actually can take a lot of, um, inspiration and, and knowledge i suppose from the way that these youtube lads are going about it and girls of course because the modern game's changed the world's changed the way that people are consuming content has com completely changed long gone are the days where you have 20 30 fights before you have a british title now we're living in this on-demand era aren't we where people want things now people want things fast and you're starting to see younger fighters achieve things in a quicker period of time josh taylor's fighting to become the undisputed champion of the world in what his 17th fight Tia Fimo Lopez has just done it in his 12th fight yeah, right. all these types of things have now becoming 
moments of comparison for fans to, to reference against. Well, how goes this guy? How many fights has he had? Is he not a world champion yet? What's all that about? You know what I mean? So the, the world has moved on. And I think that a lot of um, young fighters can take inspiration, like I said, from the YouTube guys of, of the marketing aspect of this game. It's all right being brilliant in the ring and doing what you do in the ring. But the extra spice, the extra bit of sugar on top, as you've got to be able to rock a microphone as well. You've got to be able to cut a promo. You've got to make me be asked about you. And when you do an interview, be good in the interview. Make, make, make me think I either want to tune in to see this dude get knocked out or I'm tuning in because I'm on the hype train with this guy. I want to, yeah, I want exactly. to see him go all the way. It's a massive part of the game. Don't neglect that part of the game. There's a reason why the promoters are looking at the YouTube guys going, some money in this, 20 million YouTube subscribers, this fella, I don't give a shit if he, he can fight or not. Stick him in, man, because we're all making some money. Well, mate, all you've got to remember, all you've got to think about is who was fighting in Tokyo against Logan Paul? Mayweather. And as much as people say, oh, Mayweather's making a mockery of boxing, Mayweather's getting paid an absolute wedge just to, just to dance around. I'm sorry, but well, if you watch it. some... But this is it, right? You, you then have a narrative starting to form online where people are going, Logan Paul could beat uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather, <laughs> man. He's too big for him. He's too big. What the? What are you talking about? What's it? What are you talking about? Stop it. They view, and then they do, then they they join in, then they because it's. I think it, it all started with Mayweather versus McGregor. I, I'll be honest. I'm a Mayweather fan. I am the biggest Mayweather fan. All my friends, the. the a lot of them looks like, yeah, but well, Mayweather picked and choose. I'm like, he's the, he's the greatest of all time. Him and Andre Ward, in, in my opinion, are two of the best fighters. Now, I actually had doubts of Mayweather beating McGregor. I, I know you probably say, but I, no, same. I went with McGregor until the second round, and I was like, Mayweather ain't even, my, my, Mayweather's not even. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're 100% right. The, I mean, at that time, I mean, it's easy to think that now. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. And for us to have this conversation now, people will be going, what are these two talking about? But at the time, F Floyd was a, was done. He, he, he'd retire. That's it. See ya. Ta-da, everybody. I'm out of here, right? So you've got this young, fresh mixed martial artist that is the biggest star in combat sports. I don't care what anybody says. He was, he was murdering everybody in, in mixed martial arts. All right, the Diaz fight, but he went back, he beat Diaz. He's become the champ, champ, all this. So you do, you think to yourself, well, it's not a guy off the street fighting Mayweather. It's not a guy out of retirement fighting Mayweather. It's, it's a mixed martial artist in the prime of his life right now. Hmm, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. So you start to get, and then you see the press conferences and you're going, Go on, God, a lad. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in on the. I'm in on the buzz. But like you say, anybody we have Brendan who knows what they're watching, you watch three minutes and you go, ah, yeah, right, yeah, okay, all yeah. right, yeah. You, you, I, I got it. I was on the hook. I was on the hook. You got me. You thinking brought me. Thinking that as well, though, isn't he? McGregor's probably thinking that as well. He's probably thinking because did McGregor ever think he'd beat him? Knowing Conor McGregor, yeah. I think, yeah, I think he did. I think he did. I think he did. And you know. Connor's not one to let that go. He, he will. He's still working on the boxing. The problem. The, the only Connor. Connor could win boxing fights. I'm convinced of that. I don't know at what level, but he could win boxing fights. He fought the best of all time. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> the best right fighter of this particular generation. Anyway, that's who he's gone in with. He's not. He's not fighting a mug. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's not fighting. So, who's going to stand there and trade? Who's going? And, and there's going to be a lucky shot. Like. Mayweather's, it, it's still, I, I think Mayweather is still the damage in the in the, the uh, division now. Pro not, probably not so much against the likes of Crawford and that. I think Crawford will probably be too big. Too, but Crawford and Spence, are, well, no, maybe not Crawford, but Spence definitely is big, isn't it? I mean, we've got to think of the achievements that Floyd did. He came through weights. He's not really a 147, is he? He just went up there and he just mugged everybody off because he was just mint, you know? I, 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 honestly, I always watch his fight with Gatti. I always, I'm, when, when I, um, I used to um, I used to just a bit of bit of boxing and my trainer turned around to me once and was like, watch Mayweather versus Gatti. And I've, I've it was like just watch how good Mayweather was. And when you watch mm -hmm. it, you just think that and that's when people say that Mayweather's got no power. He was never snappy. Oh well, mate, the, the thing about Mayweather's a clever bugger, right? Because early Mayweather and Tiafimo Lopez is doing this now, right? And I think he fully appreciates what Mayweather did. There's two Mayweathers. There's pretty boy Floyd Mayweather. 
go and watch that guy. That guy's a killer. That guy's yeah. taking dudes out for fun, man. And he's checking out top level guys. You, he then gets to Oscar De La Hoya, puts on the performance against Oscar De La Hoya. Then he becomes money. Now it's about, oh, how do we make some dough here, man? I'll tell you what we do. We market this zero. Ain't nobody going to break the May Vinci code. We're going to change this up. I, I don't need to commit. I don't need to overcommit myself to these young killers that are coming through. I'm just going to put on defensive masterclasses and box the bloody ears off. And don't get me wrong, he still took dudes out along the way. But nine times out of ten, it was just sweet science. You know, clever dude, man. Very, very clever dude, the way that he went about it. But you're right in what you're saying. Go and watch Pretty Boy. If you want, if you want the absolute mustard, go and watch Pretty Boy. Yeah. Do you remember Mayweather versus Alvarez? I think it was the fifth round when Alvarez was throwing some punches and Mayweather was doing his slipping. And then I think Alvarez threw another punch. Mayweather moved out of the way. And then Alvarez looked at his corner as if to say, what, what is this bloke here in the middle of the... Like, why can I not eat him? I'm meant to be the young up-and-comer who's meant to yeah. win this fight. I can't even eat him. Yeah, I know. Mate, mesmerising. Mesmerising stuff at times. Definitely. Um, going back to the UFC... Um, where do you see Darren Till going next? Well, he's got a fight coming up on April 10th. He's fighting Marvin Vittori, uh, which for many will be classed as the Battle of Europe, who's the best middleweight in Europe. I think the good thing for Darren is that uh, the champion Israel Adesanya, who went up to fight at light heavyweight recently, who, who came up short at light heavyweight, when he's been asked questions about, is there anybody at middleweight that you fancy having a dance week? He's always said Darren's name. Darren just needs to put a bit of a, a run together in order to get that knock. So a win against Vittori, who has already been in, we had a Sanya and, and lost the split decision. A win in that fight, I wouldn't be surprised if his next fight after that is for the middleweight title. Now, there'll be a lot of people saying, is he deserving of that? There's Robert Whittaker in the division who's on a bit of a run at the moment. Maybe he deserves another go. I'd agree with that. I think Robert Whittaker should be the next guy, but we're talking about a superstar in Israel Adesanya. And... Every now and again, the UFC will will dance to the tune of the superstar. If the superstar wants to dance with an outspoken scouser, then that's what he's going to get. So I think if Darren can put in a performance and put a, a get and get a, a good win against Vittori, which is tough because Vittori's a good fighter, um, I think he'll fight for a title this year. It makes me laugh, he just don't. I watched the video on social media the other day. I don't know if you've seen it in the garage with uh, a police officer and uh, he was oh, mate. <laughs> I was just watching it. I was thinking, oh, Darren, I was thinking, Darren, what are you doing? But I couldn't stop watching it. Literally, I couldn't stop. I, I watched, my wife was like, what are you watching? I was like, oh, don't, don't worry about it. It was, it was just hilarious. The, the one police officer was looking at, it, was looking at his officers, if to say, this is Darren Till, this is, you need, look, if, if, if he flips, he's going to work seriously out, yeah? <laughs> uh, Controlled, mixed my he's controlled, he was controlled, mate. Yeah. To an extent. <laughs> mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. It really has. Likewise. It, it, Likewise, uh, I've enjoyed it, mate. No, no, I've uh, I've re really, really enjoyed it. Uh, as I said, the viewers wanted to get you on. Um Tyson Fury versus Joshua. Before we leave, what Don't you do Don't you do <laughs> Sorry, I had to I had I didn't want to do it straight away, but I thought wrong. <laughs> and I absolutely love the hoodie, by the way. The Gatti, yeah, man. Got to do it. Got to do for a little bit of Gatti Wood. I've been talking a lot about trilogies and rematches and various things, obviously, in the light of Estrada and uh, Chocolate Tito at the weekend. So I thought I'd chuck this on. The, um, are you asking me how this fight plays out, in my yeah, opinion? I, Is that where you're going? I just ask you, just, just, just your opinion. Like, when the dust settles and they've both had the, the, the fights and the, in 10 years' time, what will people? What will what what will your thoughts have been? How the fights went? Oh, that's a good one, man. That's a good one because with hindsight and like you say, the uh, nostalgia, you always look at it with rose tinted glasses, don't you? I mean, we always look back at the nineties now of Ben and Eubank and Prince Nas and all that type of stuff, and it's always positive, positive, positive. There's lots of negatives along the way with that, but there's always it's always positive with hindsight. I think. What will we? I think that the, I think the story of Tyson Fury is done. You know, when it, when we come to longevity, I mean, look at the thing that he's done, mate. It's absolutely madness, absolute madness, for him to go from where he was to where he is right at this moment in time. That is stuff of folklore. And also, let's not underestimate Anthony Joshua's journey as well. This is a kid that was in a lot of trouble as a as a youngster, turned to boxing, become the Olympic champion, and then went on this amazing run of becoming the unified champion. Yeah. 
he, he hit a, a few bumps along the way. Um, the Andy Ruiz fight and the way that he's managed to get it back. But I think out of everything here now, Anthony Joshua needs this one. He, ne- he needs this fight. Tyson, you can always spin the Tyson Fury story to look however you wish to want it to look. He went in with Deontay Wilder, who was the most ferocious puncher at the time. Nobody wanted that Wilder fight, it seemed. Maybe they did, but on the outside, it seemed that nobody wanted it. Fury went in there like six months after being back. Back. So that story looks good already. It's done. And the two-time Ring Magazine champion, that which we were speaking about earlier on, it's all good. I think from AJ's point of view, there's always going to be the shadow of Tyson Fury lingering over him, isn't it? You know what I mean? Well, you only got them belts because Fury went crackers. You know what I mean? And all the belts went all over the world and all this type of stuff. You've only done this because that. Even though his resume stacks up, you look at the guys that he's beat, I think he's done four or maybe even five of the current top ten, Anthony. It's there, <laughs> man. Yeah, uh, Parker, Parker, Ruiz. Um, who did you put? Um, somebody else. Uleb. Takam's in there, I think, as well. Takam. Eh? Povetkin. It's, it, it, the, the list. That's the thing. The list endless. That the, the mate. There you go. Dillian White. Dillian White's in there. Fury's gone in there and beat Wilder twice. I understand, but Joshua's fought all different fighters. There you go. There you go. Right, so Wilder yeah. box. Can Wilder box? Probably not. No. The, uh, so he does get a hard ride. I'm telling Wilder, if you see this, I'm sorry. <laughs> he, he, he does get a hard ride, does AJ, off the fans because of this. Or because people are falling in love with the Tyson Fury story. But AJ's resume stacks up. There's no doubt about that. And I think that he needs this one most. I wouldn't say more than Fury because they both need it. But I would say that AJ needs it. Now, win, lose, or draw, no matter what, I think. I think they will both be looked upon fondly in, in 5, 10, 20, 20 years' time. And I the fight itself, I don't think it's as cut and dry as a lot of people think. You know, there's the majority of people that I speak to from the boxing world are going, Fury boxes his ears off, man. Fury, you know, he's too slick, six foot nine, just too good a boxer to get the job done. But you're dealing with an Olympic gold medalist. Don't underestimate that shit. That's 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 serious stuff. And an Olympic gold medalist that when he gets you hurt, it's not one punch concussive knockout power. When he gets you hurt, he knows how to finish. He gets it, he gets in there and gets the job done. Now he slipped up obviously in the Andy Ruiz fight, which people will always point towards. But you look at all the other fights, once you're stung, you're going, man. Now, can he get to him? Yeah. I've I've always said. I've always said that the, within this fight, there will be moments where you think Joshua's going to win it and there'll be moments where you think Fury's going to win it. It's just the way it is because AJ's got his vulnerabilities. We've seen that in fights. Tyson Fury's got his vulnerabilities. Steve Cunningham put him on his bum, man. Come on. You know what I mean? He himself as well. Remember that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly that. You know? Um, I, w- I, would still, I would still side with Tyson to get it done. But... I wouldn't be surprised if he's getting off the mat to do it, mate, or the canvas, should I say. I went all octagon on you there. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he's uh, if he's getting off the canvas in order to to try and win it on points or whatever it may be. AJ gets a bad rap, and it's, and it's unfair. It's unfair that he gets a bad rap. He's just had to deal with what's been put in front of him, and he's ready now, and the world needs the fight. They both need the fight. And I hope they can give us something really, really special that lives up to all the expectations, the hype that we're all putting around it, so we can go again. Look at those two at the weekend. Estrada and Chocolatito, eight years on. Go again, man. If it's that good, let's do it again. You've got to, in ya. You? You've got to. You, uh, you no, you, you really have. But uh, I will, I will say, when Fury got knocked down against Wilder in the twelfth round, and looked like he was, he, he was, he was gone. If Wilder was throwing normal punches, not these massive overarm ones. That it, it, there was a possibility he could have gone then, and it, and when he got dropped in the tenth round, and like you said, you hit the nail on the head. Joshua finishes. If Joshua gets you hurt, Josh, apart from Ruiz, Joshua finishes, and Joshua can box as well. People, but Joshua yeah. outbox Ruiz. Yeah, Ruiz. His training scheme was food. Uh, I think he'll he'll be honest about. It. He'll be honest about. That. Look at him now. He's skinny as anything. He's he's lost yeah. loads of weight, but. Joshua gets you. Joshua gets you hurt. Joshua finishes you. 
I'm not saying Joshua wins, but I'm saying it's a lot closer than what people say. 100%, mate. 100%. And I, do you know something? I wouldn't even be surprised if we have a situation where we get to the, we get to the cards and half of fans think AJ's won that and half of fans think Tyson Fury's won that. You know what I mean? And then we have this big controversy. You go, oh, that's nonsense. How's he got that? How's he got that? Controversy gives you cash, man. Favor. Say that again. Who would the judges favour? The outspoken Fury or Hearn's money man? Well, you, you, you listen, we hope that <laughs> none of that comes into consideration that they've just judged the 12 individual three-minute rounds on their merits. Fingers crossed that that is the case, mate. Or Hearn's turning around and saying, them need to be a draw because this needs to be a rematch. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, but... good start, mate. Mate, I've, I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time, mate. Take no, care. no, thank you very much for giving me some time. Have a good one, pal. See you, pal. Good on, mate.